Okay, so welcome back everyone. Uh, let's continue talking about similarity. Uh, before we do, um, any questions on what we just discussed? So I think everyone probably, it seemed pretty straightforward. Uh, we've got several different ways to measure similarity, which means we can get an idea of whether or not uh, people think two things are more or less similar. Some of those things are pretty subjective. Uh, so they ask people to really just give a rating. Uh, other things are a little bit less directly related to how similar they think things are because they are, you're inferring that from their choice, from a forced choice task, uh, or you're inferring uh, their similarity or the features that they think are similar uh, based on the, uh, the sorting uh, strategy that people might. So we've got several different ways to measure similarity. Uh, let's talk about different theories of similarity. So I want to talk about four, and we'll talk about the first two in the most detail. Uh, the second two uh, build on some shortcomings of the first model and also some shortcomings of the second model. Uh, but we'll talk about each one of these in successively less amount of time. The textbook talks about uh, all of these. Uh, I don't think I talk much about the alignment model uh, in the textbook, but I do talk about all of these. Uh, and again, in some, some of the same way, we'll talk about the geometric model the most, uh, talk about the contrast model, and we'll talk about some shortcomings uh, from each of those. Uh, so in a geometric model, one of the things that I've been emphasizing, although I didn't talk about the geometry of similarity, we've been discussing similarity with a sort of a, um, an analogy to a psychological space. Uh, so we've said that two things are close to each other. When we talked about spreading activation, we said that these things are similar and they're close in memory. They're close in semantic space. So we're already using a metaphor or an analogy for similarity uh, that is geometric. In other words, things are similar because they're close and things are not similar because they're far. In the transformational model uh, description that I showed you with the progression of smartphone design, uh, the ones that were most similar were the ones that were right next to each other. They were close because one was from 2004 and the next was from 2007 or something like that. Uh, and as the ones, you know, a smartphone from 2004, smartphone from 2024 are different, they're farther away from each other in space and time. Uh, and I depicted them as being farther away on the slide. And we can say that they're less similar. So there's already this metaphor uh, of similarity and physical space. And so this first model or this first theory uh, describes similarity uh, as being represented in a psychological space. And psychological similarity is the inverse of a psychological distance. So a psychological distance is uh, the number of steps or the number of transformations or uh, the amount of neural distance that you might need to tra transfer or transverse in order to represent one concept uh, and a second concept. Uh, similarity rating task, uh, people are rating the similarity of one object to the other. So if we are asking people to rate the similarity of one object to the other, uh, one of the things we might be asking them to do is essentially determine how close they are uh, or uh, how distant uh, they are from each other. So we might ask you to say these things are six. We might give you a number of six uh, or a number five uh, for this similarity. Uh, for something like this, we might give uh, a high, a lower number because it's less similar. Uh, and in a geometric model, we make the understanding or the assumption that all of those numbers correspond to some internal psychological space, some internal space that represents all of the fish uh, that are in this stimulus set. If we could assume that all of these fish in the stimulus set are contained in the same mental representation, uh, the ones that share the most features should be represented uh, psychologically close. And the ones that mismatch on many features would be psychologically distant. Uh, we can assume uh, that we can describe this mathematically because we're talking about a geometric model of similarity. We can use a geometric model or a geometric equation uh, to determine how similar those things are to each other. Um, so I'm not going to ask you to uh, use this uh, distance model, this distance equation, but I want to use it to explain how a, a geometric model works. Um, so for any two objects, 
this object and this object. Let's represent them with the variables. So x and x. This is x i k and this is x j k. So we get two objects and we want to say, how similar are they? Or in this in psychological uh, geometry, we want to say how distant they are from each other. How far away are they? Are they close or are they far? Each dimension, remember with the fish, we suggested that one of the easiest ways to come up with a number uh, or to come up with an idea or an understanding of psychological space is to just count the number of things that they share. So if they share a feature, uh, then they're more similar. If they mismatch, they're more distant. So one way to do that mathematically is to say, okay, for this object, this feature xi, uh, and this exemplar xj, for each one of these dimensions or features k, we can make a comparison. In other words, let's look at the body shape. If they mismatch, we subtract one from the other, uh, that's gonna be a positive number, right? So we're doing a, we're using an absolute value line here. So if they mismatch, it's a number different than zero. So every time they mismatch on a feature, we add a number. If they match on a feature, uh, so they happen to have the same tail, uh, the tail minus the tail, that's a value of zero. So those things are exactly the same. So if they're different, we're subtracting something from something else. Right? So we're, we're uh, subtracting one feature from the other. We've got a, now a value of a difference. So a, a, a number, you know, we, we add one uh, to that distance. If they're the same, we add zero to the distance. Calculate the distance between this object and this object then is a process of saying, do they match or not match on that feature? Every time they mismatch, we add a number to the dissimilarity. They mismatch here, they mismatch here, they mismatch here. We now have three mismatches. And every time they match, we get a zero, so we don't add anything to it. The more mismatches they have, the more distant they are. Um, and we can sum all of those distances up to get a measure of dij, uh, which is the distance between item I and item J in this psychological space. So without getting into the details about how this might be done computationally, does that seem fairly clear and straightforward, at least uh, from a conceptual sense? So we're just matching features. If they match, there's zero distance because they are exactly the same. If they mismatch, there's some distance because they don't share the same uh, thing. Uh, in, a, in an equation like this, I literally do that on every slide. I walk the whole way over there, realize that I need to switch, and then have to walk back. So I'm just going to force myself to stand here uh, and just come back each time. So one of the things you'll probably notice is that there are some additional, some additional things going on in this equation. One of them is there's an exponent. Uh, and the exponent, uh, in this case, the exponent r, can tell us two different ways to calculate the distance, C city block distance or Euclidean distance. Now, how many of you remember enough about geometry to remember uh, a Euclidean geometry, Euclidean distance? Euclidean distance would basically tell you that the most direct or shortest distance between two points in a Euclidean space is a straight line between those two points, right? The shortest distance between me and any one of you in this classroom is an exact straight line. So if I pick anybody at random, if I pick, let's say, um, I hate to pick out anybody at random, but let's say I pick you at random. Shortest distance is this, right? A straight line between us. It's not that. That would be a city block distance. So this is the shortest straight line distance uh, between uh, one person and me. Uh, but there's a different way to calculate that, and that would be the city block distance. In other words, I walk up here, and then I turn right. Uh, so if I actually wanted to uh, you know, get to a certain point of the classroom, I might not be able to go directly through uh, all of the desks. Does that make sense? So those are two different ways to measure it. So I can measure how distant I am from any point in this classroom uh, by taking a straight line, a Euclidean distance, or I can measure the distance between me and any point in this classroom by assuming that I can only move uh, like, I guess a chess piece would, like one of those, uh, what is it, the rook uh, 
that can only move uh, in one direction and then in another direction, right? So I can only move straight up on an x-axis and then across on a y-axis. So I can get to any other point in this classroom, but I could do it in xy space. Instead of cutting across the diagonal, I move up to the row and then I move across. You're finding your seat at a theater, right? You don't jump across all of seats to get to where you're going to be. You find the row and then you find the seat. Uh, that's city block space. And that might seem really obvious in physical space. When you're trying to figure yourself, you know, figure your way around a space uh, or measure the distance between two objects in space, you realize those are the two ways you can do it. Draw a diagonal or uh, use the coordinate uh, system. For psychological space, there are some important differences there in terms of the kind of stimuli that we tend to use Euclidean distance when we're calculating psychological similarity and city block distance when we're trying to calculate uh, similarity. So this is just another example of the same type of thing that I described with the uh, walking through the lecture hall. If we've got two points on a grid, uh, and this makes it really clear what city block distance is, uh, this is the Euclidean distance, right? Uh, it's the hypotenuse of a right triangle in this case. Uh, if you're in Central Park uh, West, uh, and you want to get from this uh, address uh, to that address, that's the shortest straight line Euclidean distance, right? But just like me trying to get to any one seat in this classroom, I can't do it by Euclidean distance, right? I can measure it, but I can't actually get there. Uh, if you wanted to determine how long it takes you to get there using Google Maps or Apple Maps, this is the more correct distance because this is how far you have to walk. So you are one distance away from the point uh, by Euclidean space. You are another kind of distance away from that point in terms of the amount of steps you actually need to walk to get there. So Euclidean distance and uh, city block distance, two different ways. So when does similarity rely on, or when would we assume that people would rely on city block distance versus Euclidean distance? when we're calculating similarity. So for the first pair of stimuli, would you, based on what you know about how we've described those two different metrics, what kind of similarity do you think people are most likely to use uh, for calculating the similarity between the two fish? Euclidean space or city block distance space? What would be your best guess? City block because you can, or yeah, because you can directly see which parts are different from each other and which parts are the same. That's a good answer. So city block space is most likely for the first pairing. And the reason that city block space is uh, likely for the most pairing is that we can perceive the dimensions and the features separately. It comes down to what's known as uh, separability. And by separability, I mean that when one of those features changes, I can tell that only one feature has changed. I can perceive the change of body shape separately from all of the other things. In fact, I might even miss some of the other uh, changes. So I can say this is different on one dimension and one dimension only. And if that's the dimension that I care the most about, uh, if it turns out that that's the one thing that tells you uh, whether the fish belong in one species or another species, uh, then you can place more attention or attentional weight or conceptual weight on that dimension, almost like a rule. Uh, so that becomes really important. So city block distance seems to work when the perceptual dimensions are perceptually separable. I can perceive them separately. How about the second one? Do you think you would be likely to use Euclidean distance or city block distance for the second one? What would be a good guess there? Um, city block, because you can still like make out the dimensions. City block, because you can still make out the dimensions. Maybe it's not as easy to name them or describe them at first. Uh, and maybe there's more variability. Uh, and you know they don't have the same uh, maybe countability or binary nature of the fish stimuli that I showed you, uh, but you can still perceive them separately. If something changes in orientation, you can see that that's a different feature changing uh, than, the, um, uh, than the spatial frequency. The bottom one, uh, that's likely, if I ask which one is that likely to be used, the answer by process of elimination 
uh, is the Euclidean distance, right? Uh, so the Euclidean distance, why would we use the Euclidean distance uh, for that third pairing for the colors? Why would people be most likely to use Euclidean similarity? Well, that's easily perceptually can't differentiate from them. You can't, you can't differentiate them. And the reason seems to be, the reason we can't differentiate them as easily is the dimensions that make up the colors uh, are harder to perceive separately. We kind of know what the dimensions of color are because you make adjustments to things when you're maybe making a, a PowerPoint slide, right? Maybe you want to choose the selection of a color on a text and you want to make that shape be a specific color. You can choose the hue and the saturation and the brightness, right? Or you can choose the uh, red, uh, green, uh, and uh, cyan uh, values, right? You know, your printer can do this. And so you can change these different things but you can't always tell which one is changing. You can tell which feature is different on the fish. You can tell which features are different on the uh, sine wave gradients. You can tell that the two colors are different, but you can't tell exactly which features have changed. So if you change the, um, if you change the saturation, you will know that they are different, but you cannot always tell that it's the saturation that's changed uh, because it changes the entire color. Uh, if we change the brightness, you may not be able to tell that it's only brightness that has changed because it changes the way you perceive saturation and it also changes the way you perceive uh, hue. So the dimensions are not separable. You can't perceive a, a dimensional change in saturation separately from perceiving a whole object change. And so for that reason, uh, unlike walking uh, up and then finding the seat, which is one dimension and the second dimension, uh, people tend to perceive these along a Euclidean dimension. They don't perceive the dimension separately. They can only perceive the whole object change uh, together. So city block, when the dimensions are perceptually separable, and Euclidean, when the dimensions are perceptually inseparable. From this idea of being able to uh, assign a distance, so we use that equation to say, here are two objects. We compare them by feature. Uh, those features can be separable or not, uh, but either way, we're asking people to give us forced choice or sorting or uh, similarity ratings for a whole set of stimuli. Uh, we can determine what the conceptual similarity space of a whole set of objects is. In other words, if we look at all of the fish together in similarity space, some are going to be closer to the others, and we assume the ones that are close are the ones that share the most features. You can do this for lots of uh, stimuli, even if you don't know what the features are. You can ask people to say, okay, um, if I ask you to compare a goose with a chicken, how similar are they on a scale of one to seven? You might say that they're pretty similar, right? Uh, a goose and a duck, they're obviously pretty similar, so you would give them a high value. Uh, a goose and a blue jay, not so similar uh, because they're different sizes and different shapes and so on. So you might give them a lower number. And once you take all of these numbers, uh, you can calculate the distance of one object to any other object on the space. And we can assume uh, that they lie in your conceptual space. So sort of mental space, not physical space, but mental space in a way that's kind of analogous to a physical space. Uh, goose and chicken and duck are near each other in this mental representation. Uh, Robin, Sparrow, Cardinal, and Blue Jay are near each other in this perceptual dimension. This has implications for knowledge retrieval and knowledge representation. We talked about spreading activation. Uh, if we ask you to think about a robin, it will activate sparrow and cardinal and parakeet maybe a little bit more quickly than it will activate uh, goose, duck, and chicken. If I ask you to think about a duck or if I show you an image of a duck, it would activate uh, chicken and goose maybe a little bit more um, a little bit more uh, quickly than it would activate hawk and eagle. Uh, we can sort of imagine what these dimensions might be, even if they aren't exactly what a person might think about when they think about each one of these individual objects. Uh, so unlike the fish, where we could you could specifically see what dimensions are, maybe when people are making similarity judgments or forced choice judgments or sorting judgments around birds, uh, maybe one dimension is we tend to think about the small ones as being similar. Uh, and the larger ones as being similar. So this size dimension is something that we think about when we think about birds. 
a domesticness dimension uh, with the most wild uh, or sort of non-domestic things like hawks and eagles and maybe backyard birds uh, being on one side of the divide and the things that are more domestic like uh, chickens and duck, geese are a little bit of a strange one because they're not, they're kind of wild animals and they're extremely non-domestic, especially as we've discussed here uh, in class. But this is sort of not everyone's understanding. So the Southern Ontario understanding of geese might be different uh, from understanding of geese in other parts of the world. Most people are unaware of how violent they can get. Uh, so maybe we would put them in their own special category, uh, a, away from the other things. But you'd still probably think about them as being similar to geese, to ducks and to chickens for other reasons, right? They're members of that, uh, you know, uh, fowl category. So whether they're, uh, you know, chickens are a member of, you've got a waterfowls, you've got uh, non-waterfowl uh, animals. So there might be other ways to describe this dimension. Does that seem clear to everyone? So using that equation, we can come up with an understanding of conceptual space uh, based on people's individual judgments. So the animal and bird positions, are they the average position? Yeah, so that's a good question. So you might also ask people, uh, in addition to saying on a scale of one to seven, how alike, is a, how alike are a goose and a duck? You might also say on a scale of one to seven, how alike is a goose and an animal? Uh, and you might find that these are just closer to the overall average of animal. Uh, these are closer to the overall prototype or central tendency or average of bird. Uh, so that's a good question. We can also imagine categories living uh, sort of in this uh, conceptual space or this mental representation. All of these anim all of these birds here are members of the bird category, but some of them seem more bird-like. Uh, they're all members of the animal category, but maybe some of them seem more animal-like. Uh, and they would be more similar uh, to our representation or our concept of an animal. So thanks for thanks for asking. Um, you can understand lots of different things this way. So I talk about this briefly uh, in the textbook. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues at Indiana University, uh, Rob Nosofsky, uh, has been working on uh, how people learn concepts or specific representations of natural science categories. So obviously birds are natural science categories. Uh, you know, we can think about how they are in terms of biology and uh, different kinds of species levels and different kinds of evolutionary trees. You can do the same thing with rocks, right? So how many of you have taken an introductory course in uh, geology uh, or an earth science course where you may have to learn the difference between different kinds of rocks? Um, which you probably remember from that. Well, how many of you did well in a, in a class like that if you took it? Did you do well in that? Were you, was it straightforward? Yes? You did well? Yeah. So how do you tell the difference between different kinds of rocks? Any good strategy? Not to put you on the spot here, but... Sorry. <laughs> Not me. No? Okay. Anybody else have a good explanation for how would you tell the difference between different... What are the different kinds of rocks out there? So there's like sedimentary rocks, things that are formed off of, remember this? Uh, so you probably remember this from a class. So sedimentary rocks, right? Rocks that are formed on sediment. Uh, igneous rocks, is that right? So that those are like volcanic rocks. So if you live around an area where there's volcanic uh, activity. And then metamorphic rocks, which are those rocks that are formed uh, through some change of sediment into something else because of high pressure, right? So there are different ways in which rocks are created. There's also different ways in which rocks appear, right? Different features. It turns out there's very little correspondence between that. So those of you that were in these uh, introductory geology classes, do you remember there being any clear correspondence between what the rock looks like and how it was formed? Probably not because the color doesn't give it away. The texture doesn't give it away. Uh, the feeling doesn't give it away. The weight doesn't give it away. There are lots of different ways in which these rocks are formed. So what uh, Nosovsky was interested in understanding are a couple of different things. But first of all, what's the best way to learn about this? Uh, should you learn about this by understanding the cause of the rock, or should you lear learn about it by understanding the different perceptual groupings? But the first step to that is to understand how do people think about this? When you ask people to compare two different rocks, uh, do they think about these as being uh, similar or not? Um, and so in this first study, what they did was they asked subjects to look at photographs of rocks. 
the most uninteresting web search you could ever possibly do on a Google image search. Let's search for pictures of rocks. Um, the set included one, representat one representative token for each of the 30 subtypes listed in table one. We'll take a look at that in a second. Uh, each rock picture was square in shape and subtended in a visual angle of approximately seven degrees by seven degrees. Uh, stimuli were displayed in a gray background CRT monitor. Uh, so basically pictures of rocks at screen distance away on a gray screen. Um, on each trial, participants were shown a pair of pictures of two different rock subtypes, uh, and they were asked to rate one through nine. So just like the fish and the sine wave gratings and the colors, imagine doing that for um, 435 unique pairs of rocks. It's a lot of rocks to make, uh, to make some judgments on. Um, We've replicated this in my lab. I'll tell you about it in just a little bit, but uh, you don't have to show subjects all 435. You can show subjects a subset so that across hundreds of subjects, you can get everybody's judgments, but maybe everybody just sees 100 of them. And then another group of subjects sees a different group of 100. And so you get lots of understandings because you're going to average across uh, everyone's ratings. But for 435 trials, you see all the possible pairs of rocks that there are, including self-similarity. Uh, the really easy trials where it's like the exact same rock and the exact same rock and you're supposed to answer nine uh, on that. Uh, so we got 82 undergrads and what we have is a bunch of igneous rocks, things like uh, granite, obsidian, uh, and pumice, for example, which if you even just know what those rocks are, you know that they're not going to look at all the same, right? Uh, we've got metamorphic rocks uh, like marble um, and quartzite and slate very different characteristics to those rocks. And we've got sedimentary rocks like bituminous, uh, coal, rock salt, and dolomite. Very different kinds of rocks. Uh, so they look different, they seem different, they feel different, but they're members of these categories. And we want to know, can people categorize them? Two different representations I want to show you. First, uh, here is a three-dimensional depiction of people's similarity space for all of these rocks with the... Um, spheres as the igneous rocks. So those are the uh, pumice uh, and the obsidian rocks. Um, cubes as the metamorphic rocks. Uh, so those are the slates uh, and diamonds as the sedimentary rocks. So those are your sandstones uh, and so on. And what you could probably notice is there is very little structure here, right? Uh, there are things that are close together and there are clusters of rocks, but they don't seem to be related to the sub to the types of rocks that people are trying to learn. So relying on perceptual similarity to learn the difference between igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, and sedimentary rocks is not a helpful strategy. Uh, people can clearly show that there's some uh, representational similarity here. These objects must look alike. They have a similar saturation, a similar lightness, and a similar grain size, but they're from three different kinds of categories. Uh, some, down here, we've got uh, sedimentary rocks, igneous rocks, and metamorphic rocks, which look a lot alike, and people can appreciate that similarity. And when you calculate these multidimensional scaling solution, you can see that they are close to each other in that multidimensional space, but they're from three different categories. Uh, this is just another way to look at it. Uh, this is exactly the same solution, but now showing pictures of the actual rocks uh, and showing them on four different dimensions of grain size, lightness, organization, and saturation. Uh, so in this case, same rocks, same solutions, but now four dimensions instead of three dimensions. So we depict them on two two-dimensional uh, uh, slots. And you can see that some things really do look alike. Uh, they really do look alike, even though they come from other uh, categories. One of the things we're working on in my lab, by the way, is we, like I said, we've sort of tried to replicate some of this. It's an easy finding to replicate uh, because you're just asking people for uh, similarity ratings. One of the things we're interested in is if, suppose, you were to ask people who are experts in geology. Suppose we ask people who were professors of geology here at Western or Earth Science, uh, would their representational similarity space uh, be noticeably different? One of the things we expect that it will be uh, is that there will be a greater differentiation between the rock type. Uh, so experts, if we think, if, if experts think the way we think they do, 
uh, they should show greater separation between igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, and sedimentary rocks, and subtypes of those categories, and be less likely to rely on perceptual similarity. Uh, this We'll talk about this later when we talk about categorization and expertise uh, later in the term, but experts tend to understand the causal relationships or the deep structure relationships and are less likely to pay attention to surface features. So we have also created a large set of rocks and we're now trying to ask a set of experts in geology, hey, uh, how alike do you think these things are? We're not showing anybody 435 pairings. I think everybody just gets 30 uh, and then a, another set gets a different 30 and so on. Okay, so let's talk about some of the core assumptions of this geometric model. I wanna talk about these core assumptions because each one of these turns out to have some shortcomings. And this will lead us into the next model or theory of similarity. So these are core assumptions of a geometric model. If we assume that objects are uh, represented in mental space in a way that is analogous to physical space, then these principles should hold true. These should be assumptions of a geometric model. Minimality, symmetry, and triangle inequality. Minimality is pretty straightforward. A thing has to be closer to itself than it is to any other object. That's true mathematically about something in Euclidean or city block space, right? I am always closer to myself than I am to anyone else, right? Uh, any point in this classroom, if we map any point on two dimensional spaces, right? Uh, or three dimensional space, X, Y, and the Z axis, any point is gonna be closer to itself than any other possible point. That just makes, that's just common sense, right? I mean, you can't be any closer than self-similarity. Um, so you could represent this in multiple ways. Uh, the similarity of A to itself has to be, the distance of A to itself has to be less than the distance of A to B. Uh, the distance has to be less than or equal. The distance of one thing to itself has to be less than or equal uh, to the distance between that one thing and anything else. So in a geometric space, you have to be most similar to yourself. But when people make judgments, especially when they make perceptual judgments or they make judgments on things that have, uh, when they're not easy to perceive, or they make judgments based on things that uh, are relying on perceptual input and conceptual top-down processing, they often make errors uh, which suggests that they're not always relying on uh, this minimality assumption. Uh, so the letter S is shown twice on a screen. Subjects are faster to correctly say that the two tokens are similar than if the twice shown uh, letter W. So S is more similar to itself than W is to itself. Now that might not seem like a really big problem uh, for a geometric model. Uh, but it does suggest that people don't always rely on strict uh, geometric similarity calculation. The reaction time measure of similarity to the letter S is more similar to itself than the letter W is to itself. But if we assume that all of the letter similarities, you know, in terms of physical characteristics of letters, are in some multidimensional uh, geometric space, every one point should be a value of zero, right? S should be just like S. W should be just like W. But if S is closer to itself than W is to itself, it suggests that the space isn't the same for every letter. Even if all of those letters might reside in the same psychological space, it isn't equivalent for every point. It suggests that it's, a, it's not a direct correspondence uh, with uh, geometry. Other violations. Um, the letter C can be more letter more similar to O than W is to itself. So there might be certain shapes or characteristics of objects which render them more similar to non-identical pairs than some identical pairs are to each other. Again, suggesting that the individual points in psychological space might not be equivalent. Uh, an M uh, is more likely recognized as an F than an M. Sometimes people, when they're uh, quickly presented, uh, might make errors uh, that suggest that two things are more similar than something is to itself. So these are really hard to 
effects to find. I mean, you have to present things really quickly. Uh, you have to make it a difficult decision. Uh, you have to make it a difficult perceptual decision. But it does suggest that the space might be different for each individual letter. And if the space is different for each individual letter, then an overall geometric space might not be operating uh, for this particular set of stimuli. And if it's not operating for really similar, really simple stimuli like letters, then it might not be operating for more complicated uh, stimuli. stimuli. The second assumption is the assumption of symmetry. So minimality is all about things being more similar to themselves. Symmetry suggests that the where you start doesn't make a difference. Uh, the distance between me and the caution uh, triangle back there is exactly the same as the distance from the caution triangle to me, right? In geometric space, that makes obvious sense. It takes me just as long to get there as it takes me to get from there to here. Uh, there shouldn't be any shouldn't be any difference, but that may not be true in psychological space. I mean, it's not always true in physical space, right? It takes you, depending on the time of day that you might be driving, it can take you longer to get to Toronto than it takes to get home from Toronto, right? It's the same distance, but it takes you longer to get there. Uh, we can use the same idea when thinking about psychological similarity. Sometimes there's no symmetry effect. So a symmetry assumption if everything is true in, geom in, in geometry, uh, the distance, distance between I and J should be the same as the distance between J and I. Shouldn't matter what the comparison is. But a lot of work in the 1970s suggested that people make judgments that are well out of line with the symmetry assumption. Now, just as a, a point of uh, content here, this is these studies that Tversky did, uh, carried out, were done in the 1970s. Uh, in the 1970s, you probably remember this as the Cold War era. You weren't alive in the 1970s. I mean, I was alive in the 1970s, but I do not remember the 1970s as the Cold War era. I wasn't thinking about geopolitics when I was seven years old. But most of us understand that in the middle part of the 20th century, uh, the geopolitical setup of the world uh, was often set up with a sort of a, a, a Western Europe North American uh, non-communist side of things, uh, and then a Soviet Union, uh, communist China, North Korea side of things. And some of the wars that were fought in the middle of the 20th century, uh, especially in the United States, like the Korean War uh, and the Vietnam War were fought specifically around this uh, geopolitical setting. Uh, the current um, sort of uh, economic impasse between the United States uh, and Cuba, for example, is a fallout of that geopolitical uh, setup in the middle part of the 20th century. So when Tversky asked his subjects in 1977, they had a slightly different understanding of uh, China, though it still is a one-party uh, government. There's still a communist party in China. Um, then maybe we do now. Um, North Korea was judged to be more similar to China than China was to North Korea. In other words, the order of comparison seemed to matter. In the 1970s, communist China was perceived to be closely aligned with the Soviet Union of the time. It was seen as a communist totalitarian state. North Korea would have been seen very much like communist China, but the reverse comparison isn't true for most people. Uh, it wasn't true in 1977, uh, and it probably isn't true now. North Korea was seen to be like China because they shared the same uh, Stalinist style of government, right? They shared the same influence of the former Soviet Union. But North Korea was judged to be a smaller country. Uh, it was judged to be um, you know, a different entity, maybe a, a subtype of the kind of government uh, that was running in China at the time. So the comparison order matters. If I ask you, um, how similar is North Korea, uh, Korea to China? You might give it a higher number. If I ask you, how similar is North Korea, or how similar is China to North Korea, you might give it a lower number. Uh, they're still similar, uh, but the comparison order seemed to matter. Probably still matters today. Um, so, And this can be seen in lots of different ways. If you ask people, uh, to make comparisons about things for one that seems to be uh, superordinate, 
uh, sometimes that comparison direction really matters. Uh, subordinate things are seen to be more like their superordinates than vice versa uh, by virtue of being in that subordinate structure. Again, this suggests that people don't see things solely uh, in terms of uh, geometry. We might represent things loosely in a geometrical space, but maybe the space isn't exactly the same as physical geometry. Maybe those dimensions can stretch and uh, contract based on how the question is asked. Finally, uh, the last uh, assumption is this triangle inequality. A straight line connecting two points is the shortest point, the shortest uh, distance uh, between two points. In other words, if you've got a triangle, you know how this works, right? If you've got a triangle, a right triangle, let's say, uh, that hypotenuse of the right triangle is gonna be the shortest distance. If I try to use a city block by following the non-hypotenuse uh, lines of the triangle, it's gonna be longer, right? That's the triangle inequality idea. One line is not equal to the others. The whole point of a triangle or a, a non-isosceles triangle or equilateral, it's an equilateral triangle. Is that one that has equal sides? So for these uh, right triangles, the whole point is that the lines aren't the same, right? In order for it to be a right triangle, you've got a hypotenuse of that right triangle. That's that city block Euclidean distance we talked about. So they're not equal. Uh, people would likely uh, regard this as triangle inequality. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. Uh, so let's imagine a stimulus space with some uh, objects that vary in size. We've got small, medium, and large objects, and we've got white, middle, and darker red objects. So two-dimensional structure. Things can differ on color, and they can differ on size, and you can perceive them separately. So you should be able to understand city block space. Uh, you could also understand Euclidean space. Um, and I wanna pick out of this array uh, four different objects. We've got the A object, the small white circle. We've got the B object, the small pinkish, uh, the medium sized pinkish uh, circle. And then we've got the large red circle and a small red circle. Does that make sense to everybody? So we got the A, B, C, and D objects. And now suppose we ask people to make judgments of similarity about all of these different objects. If we're asking people to make judgments about all of these objects and they reside in a uh, similarity space that is somewhat like this space right here, uh, where we've got a size dimension and a color dimension. We assume that they are uh, in this multidimensional, two-dimensional space. Uh, the distance between A and D, that's a one, two, three uh, point distance, uh, should be, uh, the distance between A through D and D through C should be longer than the distance of A, B, and C. Does that make sense to everyone? So there's your hypotenuse, uh, there is your non-hypotenuse. So if I'm making comparisons of A and D, I would give that a certain number, a certain similarity judgment. And then I make comparisons of D through C. If I add those two numbers together, uh, in other words, if I understand what those two similarities are, the similarity between A and the D and the similarity of D and C should be larger than the similarity of A to B and B to C. Does that make sense to everyone? So in triangle Euclidean space, this is a shorter line than this is, right? But if I, make if I ask people to make those similarity judgments and I calculate their psychological distance, it turns out to not be the case at all uh, because people are often making city block judgments the A, D, D, C line will be rated uh, as shorter. Nobody's actually rating the line as shorter. What we're doing is inferring the shape of psychological space based on the fact that A and D kind of look alike. They are different in color, but they're exactly the same size. So that's, that single dimensional match, people seem to weight more heavily. Uh, the single dimensional match of C and D, although they're different size, they're exactly the same color. So people perceive that single dimensional match and give it more weight. And so it's as if when you're making those comparisons, you contract the psychological space so that it pulls these things closer together. And when you make this comparison, you squash the psychological space so that it makes those same things seem more similar. So much so that this comparison uh, suggests a shorter path through the 
ADC line than the hypotenuse of the triangle. And that's what I think I have uh, on the same, uh, on the next slide here. So in pure geometric two-dimensional space, A, B, and C should be shorter than A, D, and C. We know that's to be the case uh, with geometry, but in when people are asked to make similarity judgments, uh, A, D, and C appears to be a shorter path based on individual stimulus comparisons. This is a violation of the triangle inequality assumption. Even if we get people to give us ratings that suggests objects reside in two-dimensional space, when we ask them to make single comparisons often, they will over-prioritize or overweight single-dimensional matches. Anytime something matches on a single dimension, we just seem to like it, right? It overemphasizes. Uh, that similarity. And so when you see a, uh, a, a size match, you ignore the color dimension or you sort of squash the color dimension. Uh, it makes these things seem more similar. When you see a color match and not a size match, you squash the size dimension. So psychological space, geometric space, seems to be malleable based on the way the questions are being asked. Simi the symmetry assumption works the same way. The minimality assumption seems to work the same way. And this triangle inequality assumption seems to work the same way. In other words, the context seems to matter. The way in which you uh, set up the contrast seems to matter. The question seems to matter. It doesn't matter for geometric uh, judgments, but it does matter for psychological judgment. And that's what gets us into the next model. The next model, oh yes, sorry. Question. Yes. So a more psychological example of the, oh, if I could just get this thing to work. Um, so a, what would be a better example of the triangle inequality uh, case? So you suggested grouping people. Um, so I'm just wondering, in the previous examples, for example, symmetry, we have the geopolitical example, yeah. which is less mathematical. So I'm just wondering if... That's a good... So let's try to come up with one. Um, what would be two different kinds of... What would be a set of different kinds of people that might differ? Uh, let's use social categories or occupational categories uh, that might have two different groups. So what are two different dimensions? Perhaps, maybe, uh, age might be one dimension. We might have younger and older people. Uh, and then what would be another possible dimension uh, that we can imagine? So younger adults and older adults, uh, and maybe we would have uh, a group of professional uh, individuals, so people who go into a profession uh, versus people who uh, maybe are trades uh, workers. So everybody can be financially independent whether they go into a profession or a trade. Uh, it doesn't seem to depend on age. You can get better uh, at your trade if you uh, are at a certain age. Um, and then you're supposed to ask people to make these. So let's suppose this is, uh, let's keep this as the uh, trades dimension. Let's keep this as the age dimension. Uh, if you ask someone who is a young professional and you ask someone who is a young uh, trades person, you would probably perceive them as being really close in age. They're both 22, right? And you might say, well, he's a 22 uh, year old accountant in training, and he's a 22-year-old plumber in training. Different career paths, but it doesn't matter, right? What matters is they're both 22. Um, I then might say, here's a 65-year-old accountant and a 65-year-old, or sorry, sorry, here's a 22-year-old accountant and here's a 65-year-old accountant. They're different ages, but they're both accountants. Uh, so I know that they're uh, very similar in that regard. So maybe I overemphasize or I more heavily weight the similarity on that dimension. And if I then picked somewhere in the middle, uh, someone who does the books for a plumbing company uh, in, a, in is four, 40 years old, uh, that might be that sort of middle comparison, right? Uh, and so it, rather than finding the uh, younger plumber to be closer to the older accountant by virtue of this diagonal, uh, we probably would find that the two uh, tradespeople of the same age are highly similar, sort of squashes that dimension. And the two same trades, different age people are highly similar, sort of squashes that Y dimension. 
Uh, and so the idea I think would be the same. Does that seem like a good example? I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna revisit this lecture because that's an excellent example. And I'm gonna work that out so that I can use it the next time I uh, give this lecture and probably try to put it, I don't think I have that in my text, do I? If I ever do a third edition of this textbook, that would be a really good example. Um, so thanks for, thanks for asking that question. Um, I think that actually works. I think that's a good example because it suggests this preference for unidimensional matches. When we're asking people about their comparing them and we notice that they're the same age, we emphasize that as being something that they're similar, even if they're different uh, backgrounds or different trades or different uh, professions. Yes. Sorry, so would this work if we had the big white circle as well on the top left? Same idea. Yes. So same idea. We can. I'm just using these uh, four stimuli to sort of sh show the triangular uh, shape, but the same idea would be there. Uh, so we can imagine different trades, uh, different professions. Uh, or other kinds of categories. So I'm probably gonna sit down and think about other ways to sort of put uh, different kinds of objects, maybe uh, different kind of animals or something uh, in this category. But I like the age and uh, trades uh, or uh, occupational category uh, example, where we can imagine different occupations, uh, different ages. We're gonna think, but the point is that people will overemphasize or they're heavily emphasize single dimensional matches so much though so that it distorts the psychological space and the geometry. And this leads to that next model, uh, which is the contrast model. And that's what Tversky was trying to get at in his research in the 1970s. So a lot of those examples like uh, the uh, communist China, Korea, ex North Korea example, uh, were a way to understand how the question itself matters. When you ask people something about similarity, if you ask them all the different uh, configurations, sometimes the order matters. The order can prioritize one dimension over the other. Uh, in the triangle inequality example, knowing something about a particular occupation or knowing something about an age match might uh, overemphasize or help you emphasize that dimension in a different way. So Tversky, rather than assuming that the, the distance between two points is simply uh, a geometric distance, which you can calculate by shared or not shared features, which is what that, that whole equation was, uh, assumes that it's a combination of common and distinctive features. So in Tversky's model, the similarity of A and B uh, is given by the common features. So what do A and B have in common? So what are the shared features? And we can use any model uh, to determine that. We can say there are direct feature matches or there are features that are close in perception or there are features that mean the same thing. So what are the common features? And then we take away from that the things that are unique to A. So what is, what is, if we're comparing A to B, we're comparing, comparing apples to oranges, what do apples have that are unique? And then what do oranges have that are unique? So you have to take those away. So is there something that's distinctive about category A that B does not have? Then that can't contribute to similarity very well. The key thing about the contrast model, in addition to saying similarity is given by a combination of shared features, and then taking away distinctive features from each category is that it also assumes that you, you might know more about one of these. Maybe you know a lot about uh, one particular occupation, but you don't know as much about another. Maybe you know a lot about apples and not so much about oranges, right? So it assumes that these things can be weighted based on your individual knowledge. If you know a lot about China, but you don't know a lot about North Korea, then comparisons to China and North Korea will be dependent on that individual knowledge. So the contrast model predicts asymmetric similarity because A is not constrained to be equal to B. So we don't need to assume that we know the same amount. Um, and these, so the function of A minus B may not equal B minus A. North Korea is predicted to be more similar to red China than vice versa if red China has more salient distinctive features. Red China was the term used in the 1970s, uh, refers to the mid-century communist China as it was connected to Soviet superpowers, red being the color uh, that was common to both of those countries, Stalinist government. That's my song. It's nobody. It's an unknown number. It's probably a scam. These, have they just increased? The number of times that I've gotten a text message from Scotia Bank, 
uh, telling me to click that my card has been compromised on this sketchy website just seems to be getting higher and higher. The number of times that we could not deliver your package uh, has come in. Uh, no, I know the, the companies don't always deliver packages on time, but I know who I ordered from, and I didn't order from this random site. <laughs> uh, and furthermore, nobody had this, nobody sends me text messages. Anyway, I don't know who that was. Uh, I'm sure it was nothing interesting. Uh, meanwhile, other members of my family who use the same shared reminders list on Apple that add things to the grocery shopping list, I notice have also added things. So I see that in the reminders. Cashews, we get cashews on the way home. Uh, it's one of the irritating things about having multiple devices connected, isn't it, right? You just have to sort of ignore them. This goes back to the whole thing yesterday or last week, we talked about interference. I usually have everything silent, but phone calls, because sometimes in the past phone calls have been like actual important things, like somebody's in the hospital or whatever, right? They call you. Uh, so I usually let phone calls come through, but I'm starting to have second thoughts about that because it's never anybody important. Uh, it's always somebody unimportant. Did this all make sense though? Uh, when I distracted you all with my distraction, also like the, <laughs> also like the study we talked about uh, last week, where being in view of someone who's distracted can also distract you. You were now all in view of me as I was distracted by a call from no one. Uh, okay, so anyway, the they may not equal each other. We just might know a lot more about one thing, and so the comparisons aren't going to be equal. And if similarity is shared features, and then taking away distinctive features and distinctive features, if I know a lot here, I'm taking away a lot when I ask about the distance between A and B, and I don't know as much about the distance between B and A, because I don't know much about uh, the distinctive features of B. Let's talk about some problems with featural accounts. Both of these, the geometric account and the contrast model are both feature-based accounts because they assume that we're paying attention to features. Uh, whether we're paying attention to perceptual features, uh, conceptual features about government and uh, government structure, conceptual features about age and occupation, uh, color, sound, and so on. They're all features, right? Uh, we're comparing uh, geese and ducks. We don't know exactly what all the features are, but we're comparing them based on features. And so there are some limitations to a feature-based account. And most of them boil down to, do we really know what the features people are paying attention to? Like, I don't really know what the features of different governments are. I might be able to unpack them if I was given enough time, but I may not be using them when I make decisions. So we don't always know what features are. And second, features sometimes seem to depend on the question itself. So I wanna talk about some of the problems with feature-based accounts, and then we'll talk about the transformational account uh, and the other model, uh, the alignment-based theory. And then we'll talk about the overall flexibility of similarity. I think we're gonna finish up uh, at around 12.15. So feature selection is flexible and context-specific. Uh, here's an example of some stimuli from a study by Doug Medine. Um, and what he was asking participants to do was make some judgments, a forced choice judgments about this set of stimuli. The set of objects in B, so that's this set of objects here, uh, is selected to be more similar to the set of objects in T. So why are T and B more similar to each other than A and T? What would be your basis of judging B to be the more similar pair? It's all of the shapes are the same as opposed to... All of the, so all of the shapes are uh, the same uh, color, the same uh, texture, right? Uh, so B, they're all white, uh, and T, they're all checkerboard. So that makes them the most similar, right? Uh, whereas A has some uh, mismatches in it. Does that seem clear to everybody, right? So that's a better match. However, they also found that their subjects uh, related uh, when they were asked to say uh, more different. So give a difference judgment, they also selected B as being more different from the target than A was. Why is B more different? So if you're asked to make similarity, we can see why a similarity judgment is made. If we're asked to make a difference judgment, we would also choose B. Why would B be more different than A? Is it the same reason it's all a different color than the other one? It's now all a different color. So the same thing, and that's the point that Medine was trying to make. Uh, the same feature can predict similarity and it can also predict differentness. That's a problem for a feature-based model. If we're paying attention to a feature and we say that 
oh, it's all white. That feature uh, is what keeps them as being the same. And then we say, how different are they? We could say, well, they're actually more different because at least there's a checkerboard over there on A, uh, whereas this has no checkerboards. They're completely different. It's a completely different pattern. So I think it's more different. Uh, so one group of subjects asked to make difference judgments thinks that B is more different. Another group of subjects asked to make similarity judgment thinks that A thinks that B is more similar using exactly the same features. Uh, that's a problem for a feature-based account because it suggests that features are flexible uh, and our interpretation of those features uh, is flexible. Uh, another problem is that the potential number of features can be high or possibly even infinite based on how the question is asked. Again, let's look at a set of stimuli from one of uh, from the same paper. This is another paper from uh, that same uh, another figure from that same paper. Uh, the sets of objects in T are judged to be more similar to the objects in A than B. So T is the target in the middle in a forced choice, and we're going to say that they're more similar to A than to B. So for the first pairing, why is A the more similar match? What's the explanation for A? being a better match. In set A, there's at least a square, whereas B doesn't have anything that's shared with T. So, so shared shape, square. Square is a good reason to put A as the more similar pairing. Uh, in the second uh, set, why is A uh, a better match than uh, B? They both have squares, but now A is the same color. So it's not just square, it's black square. Um, why is A the better match uh, in uh, the third set? Um, that's well, none of the like shapes are the same. The black is on the same side as the black and the T. So it's now got a totally different shape but it's on the same side. So what these are suggesting is that most people can make a judgment and they can be really flexible about the features that they pay attention to. Sometimes you pay attention to shape in this set. Sometimes in this task, you pay attention to shape and color. Sometimes you don't pay attention to shape and color at all, but you pay attention to shape and color in configuration. So there's a configural aspect to it or a relational aspect to it. And it suggests that not only do features matter, but the relationship of features to other features within the same shape seem to matter. Uh, so this suggests that feature selection, the way in which we assume that people make these judgments can be really flexible and context specific. Alignment models, uh, structural alignment models suggest that this is a really important factor uh, in how people make their judgments. So here's a set of stimuli. Um, and suppose we ask people uh, to rate the similarity of objects first. So all the possible pairs. In other words, we're gonna give people some exposure uh, or some prior training to what these uh, objects are. And then we're gonna ask them uh, to make a, a match between a target uh, and some possible matches. Uh, the target is the leftmost uh, gray circle. Uh, one possible match is the size match, which is the the black circle of exactly the same shape or exactly the same size. So that's a size match, different color, uh, but it's exactly the same size. The one on the right, which I've labeled as the relation match, uh, what's the possible, what makes that a good match? If you were choosing that as the best match to the target, what would be the reason to choose the relation match? It's like the smallest in its lineup. It's the smallest in its lineup. It's a different size overall. Uh, it's a different color overall, but within its set, within its family, uh, it's the smallest one. Uh, that's the same kind of process you might use if you were selecting the youngest person in the family uh, as being similar to the other youngest person in someone else's family, right? The, how many of you are the youngest person in your family? you all have that in common, right? I mean, you, you're the youngest person in your family and you probably have some shared uh, experiences. How many of you are the oldest person in your family? Uh, you also have some shared experiences. Uh, even though you're from different families, you're the oldest uh, of your siblings, right? So you have something in common. What they found is that when people see that, in other words, when they rate all of the gray objects, when they get a pre-exposure to all of the gray objects, and then they get a pre-exposure to the black objects, 
they understand that within that set, there is a bigger one and a little one. And within the gray set, there's a bigger one and a little one. And then later on, when we ask them to make these forced choice uh, distinctions, uh, people who have a, an understanding of the category uh, choose the relation match. Uh, whereas people who do not have an understanding of the category, when just shown those stimuli in isolation, will usually choose the size match. Because the small black circle is it's kind of meaningless if you don't see where it is in its family. Right? So you wouldn't notice that it's the smallest one. So this suggests, this is an idea of a structural alignment. We align these two categories so that we know that there's a smallest, a medium, and a largest. And sometimes it's relationship, it's relational similarity that matters. Uh, you can align these things based on those uh, relationships within a category so that we can appreciate the similarity between two really different families but the two youngest might have something in common, or the two oldest of siblings might have something in common, or the two tallest buildings in two different cities might have something in common. Yes. Like age, if you're looking at like two families at the youngest, even if one youngest family is the same age as the oldest and the other family, you still compare. Them. They've got something in common. That's exactly right. That was a great way of saying, if you didn't uh, hear that, we could totally imagine two different families uh, where uh, there is a person who is the youngest uh, and the youngest person in one family is actually older than some of the older people in the other family. But because they're the youngest one, uh, they have that in common. And you can see that especially in uh, families that are pretty big, right? You can see where uh, maybe some of the youngest siblings are the same age as some of their siblings' children. Uh, my mom's side of the family is like that. There were like nine kids or something. And so there's like cousins that are older than aunts or something like that. Uh, but they all have that in common. Like I was the youngest one in the family. I was the baby of the family. So if you're the baby of the family, it doesn't matter how old you are, you have that in common. Uh, but you would only know that if you know the relationship. And so this alignment model suggests that we understand uh, similarity uh, in relation to other objects. Finally, uh, we talked about a transformational model. The transformational model is the one that I introduced early on when I was talking about the evolution of smartphones and cell phones, right? Uh, you can see the change, and you can see the ones that are most similar are the ones that have changed the least. Now, of course, with the cell phone and smartphone idea, you could also see that there was a physical uh, similarity, right? They were the same, they start to be the same shape. Uh, but we can see this in cases where things aren't even uh, physically the same. Water and steam are more similar uh, in some ways than water and other uh, liquid states. Right? We can appreciate that water and gasoline might be similar, but we can also appreciate that water and steam uh, might be more similar than water and gasoline in terms of its transformation. One is a simple transformation of the other. Uh, young kids, of course, uh, learn early on uh, that the stimulus on the top is closer to the monarch butterfly than the monarch butterfly might be to the uh, moth, even though the moth and the butterfly both fly. Uh, they both have uh, the same shape, uh, similar behaviors. We can also appreciate the similarity between the monarch caterpillar and the monarch butterfly. Completely different instantiations of exactly the same animal, right? Different phases. Uh, that doesn't mean that one is more similar than the other. It just means that we can, uh, if we're assuming transformational similarity, uh, we can uh, appreciate this uh, pairing as opposed Oh, this was, I already remind, this was just to remind me to remind you uh, of the evolution of smartphones. Um, let's talk about the flexibility of similarity. This will be our last example. Uh, I recognize that it is now 1159. We're going to finish at 1212 is my predict. No, 1215, because by the time it takes me to say 1212, uh, we've already wasted some time. Uh, 1215. Uh, so imagine a three inch round object. Uh, you can imagine a three inch round object, even if you don't think in inches and you think in centimeters, just a little bit bigger than this, right? So the average lid for your Tim Hortons coffee or a Starbucks coffee is about three inches in diameter, right? So let me ask you to think about a three inch round object and then think about two other categories. The category of quarters, right? So a Canadian quarter, uh, that's one category and the category of other round objects, which is pizza. Forget the square pizzas. Uh, let's just think about round pizzas. So 
There's one category, there's the other category. Uh, which is the three inch round object more similar to? So consider the average size of pizzas, the average size of quarters and the three inch round object. If you have to make the judgment purely on similarity, which is it more similar to? How many say quarter? How many say pizza? There's no right or wrong answer, but most of you chose the answer that subjects have historically shown, which is it is more similar to the quarter category. That's obvious, right? I don't have a quarter with me. I never have a quarter with me unless I'm at no frills, which I need for the part. But um, you, you, I keep a quarter just for that, uh, for the no frills card. Uh, so the quarter is this big, the three inch round object is this big, your average pizza is this big. It's an obvious equation, right? The perceptual similarity uh, is pretty obvious. What about if I ask you, which category does this hypothetical three inch round object likely belong to? So now picture three inch round object, picture your average pizza, picture your average quarter, forget about similarity, what category does it belong to? Is it more likely to be a quarter or is it more likely to be a pizza? How many people say it's more likely to be a quarter? How many people say it's more likely to be a pizza? And that's the example, that's the answer that most people give. Uh, even though we recognize that it's more similar to the quarter category, uh, we don't take that into account when we make a category judgment because we know that this kind of similarity uh, may not be very helpful in assigning category membership. Uh, most people would say, well, it's not a very good example of a pizza, but the pizza is a variable category, right? Pizzas come in different sizes. And it's conceivable that if you take your average English muffin uh, and you put some pizza sauce on it and some cheese on it and a single pepperoni, you've got a very small pizza. Not a good pizza, but it's a small pizza. But you cannot make a three-inch round quarter. Just, you can't, right? Because quarters are a certain size. They're made by a certain... Uh, entity, uh, they have certain regulations, they don't allow for three inch round versions of themselves. So this is an experiment that was done uh, a number of years ago by Lance Ripps, the University of Illinois. Uh, and he asked category, he asked subjects to do exactly that for lots of different kinds of categories. Uh, the, the pizza quarter category is a really obvious one, but lots of other categories have this characteristic. Uh, like different uh, sporting events, for example. There might be things that are fixed, like the length of a game versus things that are variable. And so we can imagine things that sort of sit in between. Uh, and we could call this the fixed category. Quarters have to be a certain size. There's a rule, right? There's a set of rules that tell you what a quarter is. Pizzas are variable. Uh, they have a certain family resemblance, and maybe three inches is at the absolute smallest possible size that a pizza could be, but it can still be a pizza and be three inch round, three inches around. It could still be a pizza and be quarter sized, right? It can be a tiny little pizza, but you would still call it a pizza. So when given similarity judgments, people choose the fixed category in this case. When you pick something, it's in between. Uh, but when making categorization judgments, people rarely pick the fixed uh, category. Uh, and they do this for lots of different uh, examples. Uh, so when they're asked to make categorization judgments, uh, regardless of whether or not the fixed category is larger or smaller, uh, categorization judgments, they don't tend to prefer the fixed category. But for similarity judgments, they tend to prefer the fixed category. So regardless of size differences, regardless of these different kinds of categories, they found a fairly consistent pattern. Similarity can be assessed purely on perceptual characteristics, even if one of those categories is fixed. But judgments about what it belongs in, uh, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Uh, so when people are asking uh, to make categorization decisions, then they make decisions based on their knowledge, based on the context. Okay, uh, so just as a quick recap, here are some questions that you might experience on the midterm or on the uh, multiple choice version uh, that will be the quiz, which I think is next week. Is there not a quiz next week? There is a quiz next week. Uh, so there'll be a quiz next week. That quiz will occur at 12.30 and will go to 10.30. I'll talk a little bit about it again in class. Uh, so the quiz is after class, which means that it's going to include information from last week, from this week, and from next week. So you'll want to take the quiz after the class, right? If you don't attend class, I would suggest that you watch the note, watch the video, uh, and check the notes so that you have all of that stuff, because it'll include information from class one, two, and three. And I might ask questions for 
what are some reasons to study similarity? So what are some reasons to study similarity? What are the reasons that we gave today? What are four reasons? Can somebody list all four reasons to study similarity? Or at least list one. Grounded in perception. Grounded in perceptual processes. What's another reason to study similarity? A diagnostic tool. It can be a diagnostic tool. What's another good reason to study similarity? Uh, can underlies cognitive many cognitive processes like problem solving. And there was a, I think there was a fourth reason. And prediction. Reasoning and prediction. Reasoning and prediction. So another, but that would reasoning prediction. Yes, that's another good reason. Uh, that also sort of falls in that umbrella of it underlies uh, many cognitive processes. Uh, so reasoning and prediction, problem solving. Uh, was there one other characteristic? It's domain general. Uh, so all good answers. It's a domain general process. Uh, it um, is a diagnostic tool. It underlies things like reasoning and prediction and problem solving. Uh, and it um, is grounded in perceptual functions. So be able to recognize all of those, whether it's a multiple choice question uh, or a short answer type of question on the midterm. What is the difference? There we go. What are the four main theories of similarity? So we discussed four theories. What are the four theories of similarity we just discussed? Did somebody name the first one? Geometric model. Geometric model, second one. Contrast model. Contrast model, third one. Alignment model. Alignment model, and the fourth one was transformational model. So I would suggest at least being able to name them all uh, and maybe being able to understand a little bit about what each one is good at. None of these models, by the way, is the only possible model of similarity. That's the whole point of today's lecture. Although it's a domain general construct, uh, the way in which things are asked might nudge uh, you towards using one kind of way to interpret the features or one kind of way to interpret uh, the psychological space. So be able to know a little bit about each of those four models. What are the three key assumptions of that geometric model? So we talked about three assumptions of the geometric model. Minimality. Minimality is one. Triangle inequality was the other one. Perfect. And the symmetry. So know what those are. Uh, maybe know, and for a multiple choice question, I might ask you to know what those are, or I might give you an example of something and then ask you to choose which it's an example of. Oftentimes for the midterm, because there's a little bit more room for some written answers, I might ask you to describe what the assumption is and then maybe describe an example of an experiment or a situation where the assumption would be violated. In other words, where people's behavior would not line up with that assumption. Uh, so the comparison of uh, China and Korea example that Tversky used, and there's some other ones I talk about in the text, that would be an example of how the symmetry assumption is violated. Um, which of the four theories, this would be an example of a multiple choice question. Uh, which of the four theories assumes that similarity is a linear function of shared features as well as distinctive features? And suppose I gave you one of the four models, which would be the answer here? Which of those four theories assumes uh, shared features and distinctive features? And linear in this case. The contrast model. So this would be a great definition of the contrast model. So imagine that could be both a short answer question where I ask you to say that, uh, you could imagine this being formatted as a definition where I'd say, what's a good definition of the contrast model? And you would write a definition out. Or it could be a multiple choice question where I say, which of the following is assumes that similarity is this? And then you would choose one of those. All three possible ways to present the same kind of general idea. City block, oh, here's a fill in the blank type question. City block distance is used by multidimensional scaling where the dimensions are... What kind of dimensions do you use when it's city block scaling? So individual dimensions. Feature-based? Feature-based, yes, but one step further. Perceptually separable? Perceptually separable features. Uh, so features that are perceptually separable are used uh, in city block distance, but the Euclidean distance would be used when those features are the answer non, yeah, 
usually inseparable. Inseparable. Uh, the other term that I think I use in the textbook is integral, uh, means the same thing. So not being able to perceive them separately means that they are integrated uh, into a single dimension or uh, into a single representation. So just two more things to think about. Uh, and these might be examples of the types of things that would show up in longer answer questions. I do not ask these, by the way, these are not actual exam questions, but they might be the kinds of things that could inform longer answer, longer answer exam questions. A common expression is it's like comparing apples and oranges, which I think is supposed to mean that things can't be compared. But apples and oranges are pretty similar. Are, is there a better metaphor? Uh, what would the comparison of apples uh, and oranges tell you? So I might ask you to think about a way to reframe a common example. Or I might ask you to explain what that metaphor is supposed to mean. This might mean that you talk about a, an alignment model. Uh, that apples have one set of features and oranges have another set of features. It might mean that you talk about a contrast model, that you're familiar with one type of thing with apples and a different type of things with oranges. Maybe you care about something else in oranges than you do about uh, apples. Uh, another question, uh, and I actually have used something like this on a midterm exam uh, in the past. How do you take advantage of similarity when learning new things? So here you might want to use an example like that problem solving example, but I might ask you to sort of reflect on a specific uh, unique example that you've used. Um, do you try to group similar terms together? Uh, do you study with the same people? Uh, do you try to uncover deeper similarity relations? Uh, and do you think this helps with recall? Uh, why or why not? Uh, so I don't, I wouldn't have too many long answer uh, essays like this, but occasionally I do have. Uh, a few questions on a midterm or a final exam, which might ask you a fairly open-ended question uh, like this. Uh, give me an example of how you might use similarity to learn new things. And these might be good ways to do it. You might say, well, I take advantage of similarity because I study the same kinds of terms. When I'm studying one topic, I study that topic, or I study that chapter, or I study the similar uh, terms together, or I study similar types of equations at the same time. Yes. So it's open-ended, so you're not looking for a very specific end. As long as we can back up our thinking, that's okay, right? For a question like this, that's exactly right. Uh, as long as you can back up your thinking, that would be okay. Now, I do... Words. I am not looking for words. Uh, so I do want to say, by the way, that most of the questions on my midterm and on the final exam uh, have pretty clear-cut answers. Uh, so I might ask you to explain a violation of the symmetry assumption. You can use different examples, but you've got to get in the main principles. Uh, but often uh, I will use uh, you know, one or two questions might ask for this kind of open-ended application uh, where you have a chance to sort of explain some of these properties uh, or ex explain some of these ideas uh, and back up your reasoning. So the majority of the questions, straightforward, multiple choice or short answers with a few questions that ask you to elaborate a little bit more. When it comes time, when it gets closer to midterm time, I'll have more examples. And we can even run through some of those examples in class uh, because I wanna make sure that everybody has an idea of the different range of questions uh, that you can expect on the midterm. And the final, same idea. We'll talk a little bit about that as we get a little bit closer. The quiz next week, multiple choice. Uh, topics will be the same. It'll cover everything from, yes, from last week's class, today's class and next week's class. Uh, and there'll be a set of multiple choice questions. And I'll talk more about that uh, next week before the actual uh, class happens. 12, 14, I, I was pretty close. I did it, so, okay. See you all next week. Yeah. Um,